President Reagan was nothing if not optimistic and full of love for his country. On September 29, 1982, during remarks at a Virginia Republican Party rally in Richmond, Virginia, he said, I hear all those voices every day that say we can't succeed. Well, if we only put our heart and courage to the test, I say we cannot fail. To those who are faint-hearted and unsure, I have this message. If you're afraid of the future, then get out of the way. Stand aside. The people of this country are ready to move again. Thank you for joining us for this week's Throwback Thursday with President Reagan. Join us next week as we share another inspirational quote. Hi, I'm Melissa, and welcome to this month's live from at the Reagan Library. Remember, we do these on the first Wednesday of every month. So this just so happens to be our third at-home edition. As the California stay-at-home restrictions slowly begin to lift, uh, Reagan Foundation employees should be going back to work really soon. So hopefully next month's live from will be with me back at the Reagan Library. Uh, but until then, <laughs> welcome back to my house. In this edition, we are going to share with you ways in which you can engage and learn from the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation Institute from the safety of your own home and community. We've always had a love affair with learning in this country. America's a melting pot and education has been a mainspring for our democracy and freedom, a means of providing gifts of knowledge and opportunity to all citizens, no matter how humble their background, so they could climb higher, help build the American dream, and leave a better life for those who follow. As we create this video, the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute and the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library and Museum have been closed for approximately three months. During that time, we have been hard at work creating new resources and materials you can access digitally so you can stay engaged with our nation's 40th president. From education online curriculum, to audio and video podcasts, to virtual tours, we're working to ensure President Reagan's legacy is promoted far into the future. Are you on our email list? If you're not, don't worry. Simply visit us at reaganfoundation.org, scroll to the very bottom of our website, and click on Sign Up for our newsletter. Anyone on the upcoming Foundation events list will receive our Monday email, full of new and rich content that shares President Reagan's optimistic spirit and sense of American pride. With students learning from home during the COVID-19 epidemic, we've been providing parents with some fun and creative lesson ideas to fill the school day. These interactive primary source-based sets of lessons help students learn everything from what it means to run for the President of the United States to the importance of being an engaged and informed citizen. Is your student already out for the summer? That's okay. 
These lesson plans are always on our website and can be accessed year-round. If you're watching this, you've most likely seen our other two virtual tours, which I mentioned earlier, one on the museum galleries and one on our external campus. If you haven't watched them yet, simply go to our homepage, reaganfoundation.org, and click on Virtual Tours from the middle of the page. There you will also find a virtual tour of the Reagan Museum, voiced by actor and philanthropist Gary Sinise. While you're on our homepage, just scroll a little lower to where it says Virtual Backgrounds. So even though you might not be able to visit the Reagan Library right now, you can still pretend to your family, friends, and colleagues that you are here. Simply download one or all of our new virtual backgrounds for your next Zoom or video call, and it's like you're holding your meeting from the beautiful Reagan Library campus. Looking for content that is updated daily? How about diving into our deep treasure trove of audio and video podcasts? Every Tuesday since 2018, we have published an audio podcast called Words to Live By, which utilizes speeches and radio addresses from Governor and President Reagan, with intro and outro commentary about the speech. Also on the podcast page, you'll find our podcast called A Reagan Form, which is published every Thursday since 2018. These 45 to 75 minute audio podcasts are reruns of our Center for Public Affairs programming, both current and historical. One of my favorite podcasts we publish, which we've been creating since 2016, are our Reagan Retrospective Podcasts. Published approximately 8 to 12 times per year, these 3 to 5 minute video podcasts are videos which take a look at President Reagan's character by those who worked with him in the past. You can find these by visiting our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Reagan Foundation and selecting Reagan Retrospective from our playlist. Every Monday since 2016, we've produced our Monday Minute in the Archives series, a one-minute video podcast looking at items within the Reagan Library archives. This is a great way to see items we have in our archives that might not have ever been on display in our galleries. We are also producing live, virtual, online programming a few times per month. In May, we brought you Steve Forbes, who shared his ideas on how to jumpstart the economy when lockdown ends. Coming up this summer include live virtual programs with Newt Gingrich, Chris Wallace, Sean Hannity, Greg Gutfeld, and so many more. All of our events are listed right on our homepage, so keep watching to see which programs are coming your way. Of course, you can interact with us every day by following us on all of our social media sites, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and of course, YouTube. The last thing I'd like to quickly point out is our museum store, which is open as an online store during our museum closure. Thank you for joining us today. We hope we inspired you to engage with us more digitally and once we reopen our doors to visit us in person. As President Reagan once said, don't let anyone tell you that America's best days are behind her, that the American spirit has been vanquished. We couldn't agree more. We know you have so many choices right now out there to engage with companies digitally, and we appreciate your support that you follow and engage with us. If you have any questions about what we spoke about today, or if you have ideas of what else we might be able to offer, please just email us at info at reaganfoundation.org. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next month, hopefully with me on the Reagan Library campus. See you then. An informed patriotism is what we want. And are we doing a good enough job teaching our children what America is and what she represents in the long history of the world?
The defense policy of the United States is based on a simple premise. The United States does not start fights. We will never be an aggressor. We maintain our strength in order to deter and defend against aggression, to preserve freedom and peace. President Reagan believed that the best way to avoid war was to leave no doubt in our enemy's mind about who would win. It was with this spirit that he led our country through one of the most significant military upgrades in American history. This F-117 Nighthawk with the tail number of 803 and the nickname Unexpected Guest went into service in May of 1984 during President Reagan's administration. The F-117 was the world's first operational stealth aircraft. Their angular shape was designed to reflect radar waves. This F-117 went on permanent display at the Reagan Library on December 7, 2019. Thank you for joining us for this week's Monday Minute in the Archives. Join us next week as we share our next treasure. Like the office they commemorate, Presidential libraries are living institutions. Certainly it is my hope that the Reagan Library will become a dynamic intellectual forum where scholars interpret the past and policymakers debate the future. Welcome to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute's virtual event series. To fulfill President Reagan's mission of making the Reagan Library a dynamic intellectual forum, our Center for Public Affairs Programming offers lectures and forums presenting perspectives on important public policy issues of the day. Each year, we bring you 20 to 30 events from politicians, authors, members of the media, business and military leaders, and more. Since the March 2020 closure of many businesses across our great country, the Reagan Foundation is now bringing its events online to ensure that we are still delivering world-class content, even if you can't get to our hilltop to watch it in person. In this week's Center for Public Affairs virtual event, we bring you U.S. Representative Mike Garcia, who was sworn in as a member of the United States House of Representatives on May 19, 2020. Congressman Garcia represents California's 25th Congressional District, which includes the Reagan Library. First-generation American citizen Mike Garcia is a highly decorated United States Naval officer whose record-setting flying performance earned him the honor of becoming one of the first Super Hornet strike fighter pilots in the Navy accruing over 1,400 hours of operational flight time after nearly 20 years of military service to our nation, Mike Garcia decided to separate from the U.S. Navy with an honorable discharge and focus on his family. Speaking to the media on June 2, 2020, he said, We have an obligation to do things right while justice is served. Our children and future generations are watching how we conduct ourselves. We now invite you to enjoy our virtual program with Mike Garcia and Reagan Foundation and Institute Executive Director, John Highbush. Well, uh, just terrific uh, to have you with us, uh, Congressman Garcia. Uh, I know uh, you're still relatively brand new uh, to the office, but your stellar reputation is not new to us. And so we're, congratulations, we're just delighted to uh, have you representing the Reagan Library in Congress. Thank you, John. It's, a, it's been a huge honor uh, and, and, and truly a whirlwind uh, ride over the last year and a half uh, uh, leading up to this victory. Uh, but to, to last month uh, be on the House floor and, and take the oath again to, to support and defend the Constitution uh, and to do so for, in, in, in representing the, the best district in the nation is an absolute honor. And uh, I couldn't be more filled with pride, and, and especially right now in our nation's history, there, 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 there are a few moments in our, our 244 years of history that are as important and, and really critical to, to defining our future as right now. So it's a, it's, it's a tremendous honor to be in this office right now. Yeah, congratulations again. You know, uh, Thank you. Uh, I used to, I worked on Capitol Hill and did a number of, helped with a number of races, House, Senate side, and uh, your margin maybe was a tenth of a point off, but you you won it with a rough 55 to 45 margin, which makes it 10 points. And uh, I bet you know that's defined as a landslide. Uh, so um, uh, I, I guess we're, I, I know you fought a tough fight and did terrific. Were you expecting a margin that large? Because it seems like the nation wasn't. 
Yeah, I, I, I wasn't, is the short answer. Uh, I, I had faith early on that, that we were on the right side of history. And I, and, you know, I spent three or four months looking at the, uh, the 2018 election, looking at the demographics of the district, what went right, what went wrong for conservatives uh, in 2018. So, so I knew when I decided to run uh, that we could win and that we were going to win with the right team and the, and the right uh, work ethic and, and the right messaging, which, I'm, which we, were, we were clearly uh, uh, putting out. Uh, the, the margin of victory was, was a, a little overwhelming, even then unexpected by my perspective as well. So, uh, and, I, and I think it's a testimony to the message. It's a testimony to the hard work that the team put in. Uh, and on the heels of, of one of the, the more complicated uh, uh, controversies in the House uh, with my predecessor having to resign, it was, it was a stark contrast between someone who isn't qualified for this position and, and, and leadership and someone who is qualified for, for this position uh, and who was running for the right reasons. You know, I, I, from day one, I said I wasn't running for personal gain or, or because of my ego or, or, or God knows the quality of life and pay, uh, but because of my, my desire to serve the country and, and support and defend the constitution and do what's right. And uh, uh, I think that was the message that was resonating, and that's that's why we got the support that we we had, and and I I, I think we'll be able to continue to to gain support and and hopefully retain that that margin of victory leading into November. Uh, I now have uh, the the awesome responsibility to represent the district, all seven hundred and fifteen thousand uh, constituents, and to do so with honor, but also to to execute and to make sure that we're bringing resources into the district during one of our toughest times. So. Uh, that's the charter. That's the mission, and uh, I look forward to doing it. Yeah, me and I, I like those words. That's the mission, right? And I know uh, it was, you know, seeing your advertisements, but just knowing something about your background and your bio, uh, you know, terrific military experience, uh, naval aviator, fighter, fighter pilot. Uh, uh, I wonder, Congressman, if um, certainly that kind of experience is helpful on a resume when you're running for office. But was there something about your uh, time uh, in our armed forces working uh, in, in support of the military's efforts that um, that helped prepare you for for this recent victory this race yeah there's there's something unique about the the experiences I had in the military you know uh, there's very few experiences in life when you're when you're uh, a quarter mile behind an aircraft carrier at night and pitching seas and uh, you literally have the next 30 seconds to, to, to make sure that you get aboard safely and your life depends on it. I, I was doing that every day uh, for, a, for a period of 10 to 15 years. So uh, when, when you do that, it puts things in perspective. And, and, and for me, campaigning was hard and running for Congress is difficult. Uh, but it, but it, wasn't, it wasn't complex. It was just a, a lot of different moving parts that we needed to manage. And and during the toughest, toughest times of the campaign, you know, I would just remind our team that, hey, we're, we're not on an aircraft carrier and no one's shooting at us right now. So let's figure out how to work through this problem. Um, and, you know, uh, not only the, the experience in the military, but also uh, my leadership in the business world for the last 11 years in an aerospace company. And, and our, our district, as you know, in Simi Valley and Santa Clarita and the Antelope Valley has a large uh, footprint in the aerospace and defense business. So understanding that business, understanding the, the, the challenges that the aerospace business has right now, and, and frankly, how to lead and how to, how to run a business in one of the toughest environments. California, it's not, it's not easy to, to, to survive, much less thrive in the business world. And uh, I think that last 11 years of business experience combined with the military background and, and the resolve uh, that, that, that myself and, and the rest of the team demonstrated uh, were absolutely the critical ingredients to, to the win. And uh, uh, you know, what it did was reinvigorate the conservative values in the district. And a lot of people wrote California's 25th district off. A lot of people have written off California. And I just kept reminding people that, look, you know, we, we, we're, we're all still here. We just need to understand the message again. And, 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 and you know, R Ronald Reagan was, was the inspiration for, for a lot of the things that I said and a lot of the things that I believe in. And, uh, you know, we, we, a lot of folks have forgotten that. Uh, a lot of folks have forgotten the message and what it means to be a conservative uh, in, in, in today's world, especially in California. And we re I think we reinvigorated that a little bit. And it's, it's not a Republican versus Democrat fight. It's, it's about values and it's about doing what's right for the country. 
Uh, and, you know, in my formative years, I was, I was five years old when, when President Reagan took office and uh, th through the age of, you know, 13 years old, I, 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 was, I was witnessing our nation evolve and I was witnessing the, the office of the presidency evolve uh, during my most formative and, and influential years as a child. So uh, those, those, those are the values that have been instilled in me and I, I, I'll, I'll always, to, to my death, believe that those are the right answers. Yeah, well, well said, well said. Uh, I was really fascinated to see life's kind of come full circle for you, Congressman, because, uh, you know, Buck McKeon, who represented the, the Reagan Library in his district for a few years, uh, apparently uh, nominated you to head to the Naval Academy, right? It just, it's just, a, 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 a great story. Yeah, absolutely. It was, uh, you know, when, when, when uh, Buck McKeon's uh, first, uh, uh, his freshman year, I remember going to a local high school during a town hall that he was hosting. Uh, and I asked him as our, as our congressman what he was going to do to help our military. And this was about a year before uh, I applied for the Naval Academy. And uh, uh, a year later, I was in his office, uh, you know, going through the interview process. And uh, I ended up being uh, one of his first military academy appointees. And uh, you know, I, I kept in touch with him through the years, and, and when I flew uh, in, in Iraq uh, for seven months, I, I uh, also flew a, a flag and, a, and a, a squadron patch in the cockpit and sent it back to him in Washington, D.C. when uh, when he was in office several years later and uh, uh, visited him in D.C. once and, um, you know, never never really had a, a, an inclination that this would all come full circle, as you said, but... Uh, Having his support, and then and then also having the support of uh, uh, former Congressman Elton Gallagher, who who is a hero in that area, a hero to the nation, uh, someone who served for more than 20 years in in, in our district, different parts of the district. Uh, having the, the guidance and counsel of, of those two gentlemen uh, who who served with honor and did the right thing for the country for so long, uh, what was an invaluable advantage uh, that I had. And being able to bounce things off in the worst of times and the best of times, and uh, uh, you know that I, I take great pride in having their support, um, and I was humbled by it. Uh, they were day one adopters after after asking good questions and, and really running me through the gauntlet to make sure I was ready. Um, they, they 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 made a huge difference in this campaign. Yeah, you know, we know Elton Gallagher well, uh, obviously as you do, Congressman. Yep. And, uh, uh, big shoes to fill, right? He, he had the, this seat uh, for many, many years, right? Um, Absolutely. If I can, if I can fill half of uh, his shoes and do half of what he's done, I, I consider this a, a wild success. So, uh, but I, but that is the gauntlet, and and you know he's he's a, he's a pilot as well, so he'll appreciate this. But this is a competition, and I uh, I do want to uh, do as much as he's done, and even more so, and and, and make us all proud again, frankly, of, of this office and. and and representing the 25th district. So um, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, neat. Now you, you can't let off the throttle, right? You've got another election coming four or five months, right? And is the, the gonna be the same um, uh, combat duty, same opponent, uh, same style of race? What's your view on that? Yeah, that's right. Uh, my opponent will stay the same. Uh, uh, she, she represents the 38th assembly uh, in Simi Valley as well as part of that up in Sacramento. Um, she'll be running against me in November, and uh, look, it's the same. It's the same game plan, right? Uh, our message of of uh, of hope, first of all, and 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 an allegiance to the Constitution, to the to the country, uh, a push for lower taxes, less bureaucracy, less red tape to make it easier to survive in California, uh, securing our borders and taking care of Americans first. Um, you know, my my opponent uh, supported AB five, and and that's that's still a major issue. AB five was killing thousands of jobs. If if you recall, John, this is the one where it categorizes uh, uh, independent contractors as employees and effectively puts them out of business and a lot of small businesses with them. Killed thousands of jobs before COVID nineteen, and 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 on top of that, it's just a, a huge aggravator. So. Uh, you know, to my earlier point, it's all about being able to continue to survive in California. And I, and I, I ascribe to the theory that we, we don't have to hit rock bottom in order to make things better again in California. I, I think it is an incremental fight. It's, it's taking one seat back at a time. It's, it's replacing politicians with patriots and citizen legislators one seat at a time. Um, and, and I think that that's what this special election uh, was. It was a it was a it was a message to all politicians uh, 
uh, in California, but also nationwide, that if, if, if you can't figure out how to take care of your constituents and how to encourage business growth and how to allow your constituents to survive, then, then we will show you the back door. And, and someone who's willing to make the sacrifices to serve the great country that, that we know and love, uh, they will ultimately show up and, and more people like me will, 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 will take on this, uh, this challenge and, and, and fight this fight. Um, it's unfortunate, but California has become such a one party state right now and they don't understand how to run a business. They don't understand the challenges of, uh, of raising a family in California. And, like I said, I just don't want that to happen at the national level. We were starting to see a lot of telltales of that, harbingers of things to come. So uh, that, that was why I came off the sidelines. Uh, okay. Um, district offices, I, you know, having worked on for a member of Congress and even a freshman member of Congress, um, I presume you're getting some lit up and on the way as a, as a really important element of, uh, of your service in your district and in, in getting, frankly, getting reelected, right? That's right. Yep. And that, that to me is the single biggest measure of merit uh, leading into the November election. How, how quickly can I stand up the offices with my team? Uh, how quickly can we burn through the backlog of case, case work and constituent services that we have? We haven't had a federal representative in eight months, uh, which is a shame, uh, but it's the reality. So um, uh, I've got a saying that uh, speed is life, and, and that's no more appropriate the, than, than right now. Uh, so yesterday was exactly one month since the election. Uh, this week, we have uh, now formalized uh, the leases on three offices, one in Simi Valley, uh, one in Valencia and Santa Clarita, uh, and then the third up in, uh, in the middle of Palmdale in the Antelope Valley. So uh, we, we have three offices now uh, uh, up and running. Uh, as far as staffing, we've hired about 70% of the staff, uh, and we have... Uh, turned the lights on, gotten all the voicemail, and, and we've, we have now characterized the backlog of casework that we have, and it's close to 500 uh, uh, constituent service uh, uh, case uh, packages that we have. So that is job number one, making sure that people who haven't had a voice are now getting uh, a voice, but also getting the, the help that they need for the IRS, the VA, uh, and now with the COVID and CARES Act assistance out there, there's still folks who haven't received their checks. So uh, my goal is to have that backlog burned down to zero uh, within the next couple of months. And, and uh, you know, it's going to be a challenge, but I, I have the best team in the nation right now. I'm, I'm, I'm sure of that. We've got a great staff here in the district. Uh, and we're continuing to hire more and, and uh, move, move even quicker. So that, that's priority number one. The, in parallel, there's not a lot of legislation going through Congress right now because of the, the proxy voting and they're staying home. And there's, there's really not a lot of work happening in D.C., which to me is a is a shame. We need to be there in the front lines uh, and, and coming up with more legislation to help us get through these times. But uh, the, the, the positive side of that is it'll allow me to be in the district more and, and meet folks, meet business owners, meet constituents who are having challenges and, and uh, you know, getting the brand name recognition up to let people know that they, they, they have a, a voice and an open door for help. Yeah. And I knew that you were putting together a talented team, Congressman, because uh, you uh, appropriately stole one of our uh, solid, you know, terrific staffers here from the Reagan Foundation. And, you know, we wish her the best. And, and uh, um, you know, we're, we're excited to have uh, young people, uh, you know, real patriots um, that work here, move into, you know, important jobs and, you know, working for, uh, for members like you. So congratulations on, you know, so quickly putting together uh, a really solid team. I wanted to ask you, Congressman, um, be, because you had both military service and then, as you said, uh, in the aerospace industry, um, right here in, in, the, in your congressional district, what do you think are the long-term prospects uh, for business growth and jobs and the economy? Specific in, that, in, in this district, do you think that uh, it can take advantage of its current position and, and grow into more defense-related or national security-related jobs? Absolutely. I think, I think we're at the very beginning of what's going to be a renaissance of, of the aerospace and, and defense business and, and then all of the, the sort of secondary and tertiary uh, uh, benefits that that comes with in our district, right? Um, uh, a, a few things, a few phenomenon have happened that, that, I, that support what I said. Um, under the Obama administration, there wasn't a lot of investment made into modernization. And, and frankly, there wasn't a lot of uh, investment made into readiness. 
Uh, under the current administration, we're starting to see a drawdown in troops in four different theaters around the country or around the world. Uh, this is allowing the troops to come back home. It's allowing uh, us to spend resources, not only on readiness, but on modernization. Um, and, and, if you, and, and you know better than anyone else, the mantra of peace through strength and, and being able to uh, have the technology that dissuades our, our threats from becoming uh, uh, true threats, either kinetic or cyber, uh, to our nation is key. And, and in some cases, we, you know, we're, we're behind. And th there are two big bears right outside of our tent right now in the form of China and Russia. And this administration is starting to invest in the modernization programs that help get higher technology, higher end technology to the war fighters and start investing in those programs that, that will make a huge difference in that regard. Uh, the other dramatic uh, development over the last few years is the Space Force. And, and when you look at this, this new, the, the creation of the Space Force, this is an untapped opportunity in terms of business and, and, and program development uh, that, that we need to harness and take advantage of. Uh, and again, out in Antelope Valley, if you look at our district, right, you've got the Antelope Valley, Santa Clarita Valley, and the Simi Valley. And it's almost a physical stream of revenue in terms of, of, of the aerospace business. The Antelope Valley is the home of the primes, and then Santa Clarita Valley and, and Simi Valley are the subcontractors to those massive primes. But when you overlay now an entirely new force uh, for, for space development and, and, and support of the Space Force, that's, that's going to be a massive opportunity for us. Uh, it does require someone who understands the the, the, the domain and understands who understands the business and understands the district to, to make sure that we are getting more than our fair share of those investments in, into our district. Uh, but I think it's going to be massive. And I think what we're going to see as this economy picks back up is that the, the, the aerospace revenue will be what is the engine behind the, the, the rebirth of our economy here locally. Uh, a bump in real estate, a bump in uh, restaurants, and, and we'll all benefit from the rising tide of those of those investments. So I'm I'm really looking forward to being a part of that. It's it's historical for us. Yeah, that's great. Uh, have they made room for you, or do you think they will to uh, get you on the Armed Services Committee? Is that a, a so we're working, we're working through that right now. I'm not at liberty to talk about the committees. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, coming in freshman three quarters away through the session, uh, there's, there's limited opportunities, uh, but we're working through that right now. And uh, I think everyone sees the value of, of my background and uh, we're all trying to figure out how to leverage that to the max extent possible. So, uh, and again, winning in November will set us up uh, perfectly for January as well. And uh, it's a long-term, it, 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 and, and this vision has to be long-term. It can't just be, even 10 years, um, the, the threats that, you know, that the Chinese uh, communist government is looking at their strategy through, through a, a, a 100 to 500 year paradigm. And we need to start thinking like that as a nation. This is, this is a long arc and, and our investments and our, and our infrastructure need to reflect that long arc of survival so that we're not we're not playing whack-a-mole on a, on a biannual basis uh, relative to our defense. And, and that's how we best serve our war fighters in the end as well. Yeah, well, hopefully a number of uh, more Republicans will win in November and creates a bigger uh, uh, Republican uh, you know, faction in Congress and drive more seats on the committee and, uh, and, right. and make room for you. So that'd be, that'd be yes. great. Um, speaking of all these defense issues, I, I don't know if you've ever had the chance to come to what's now become one of the you know, premier uh, forums, national defense forums in the United States, but the Reagan National Defense Forum takes place right here at the Reagan Library. And boy, you're certainly invited, Congressman, so we'd love to have you out. <laughs> well, well, thank you. I'd, I'd been there uh, once as an industry partner, and I actually attended this, this year's uh, uh, as, a, as a guest of, uh, of, uh, of the locals in Simi Valley. And what a tremendous event, uh, powerful. Uh, Great, great way to really capture uh, where we are in the nation from, from a defense perspective and, and remind us all of why, why it is so important. So would love to be a part of that in the future, obviously. Great, you're invited. Um, you know, I've, something about your record, uh, uh, Congressman, um, your position on issues, like you said, uh, very Reagan-like positions on terms of the national debt, the deficit, government spending, and the rest of that, it seems as though Republicans in the more modern era have somewhat lost their way. 
on uh, uh, on being for smaller government and less spending. And uh, I, I just wonder if you comment on whether or not you you think uh, the Republican Party has got to get back to the days of, of uh, smaller government and less spending. The, the debt's just going through the roof. Yeah, and unfortunately, you know, we were we were compelled to aggravate that, obviously, with the COVID nineteen uh, case, and and in, and in, and in that environment, I I obviously supported the initiatives that the addition of three trillion dollars was a was a pill we had to unfortunately swallow. Uh, look, it, it, to me, the the besides the, the two bears outside of the tent that we were talking about, the national debt is probably our Achilles tendon more than anything else. Um, if, if we don't start addressing that uh, in, in some form or fashion and take the time to, to, to uh, mitigate it and, and ultimately eradicate the debt, uh, it, it will be the bane of us. Um, and in some form or fashion, we, 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 we can't just keep pushing this off. Uh, what I think is happening with our party, it's both parties, frankly, it's, it's all hands that are, are probably guilty of this, is it's hard. And, and when, you, when you look at this debt and you look at the number and, and you look at the numbers that we're dealing with on an annual basis within the budget, you look at our GDP and you realize it's, it's, it's effectively dwarfed by the, by the debt and the deficit spending, uh, it, it, it becomes overwhelming. Uh, and, and what legislators really need to do is, is do a line-by-line -line assessment on the cost side and, and on the expenditure side to really make sure that, that we're, we're, we're spending money where it makes sense and we're getting the bang for the buck out of it. And to do that, it requires a level of attention and diligence and, and, and you know, uh, manpower, frankly, that I don't think anyone really wants to do. And I, I think that's been the shameful part of it. Um, so my commitment is to do that, uh, to, to push that. It's, it can't be a, a one-man job. It needs to be 435 members who adopt that mindset. Uh, or, or it will be the end of us at some point. It may not be in our lifetimes or our children's lifetime, but it's going to come to roost eventually. and We've got to pay attention to it. Um, I think the natural synergies between less federal government uh, and the national debt are, are, are standing right in front of us. And it's, it's clear as day to me that if we can just download some of the responsibilities and authorities from the federal government to the states and to the local city governments, get that expenditure off the federal government books, uh, that will help mitigate the, the debt challenges that we have, but we'll also get a better product at the local level. And you look at, you look at how much is spent in the Department of Education, I think it's $68 billion a year for three or 4,000 employees in DC. Uh, that money doesn't go to the schools. And by the way, that 68 billion isn't spent on the grants or any of the, 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 the scholarships that the DOE, the Department of Education uh, uh, lets out, right? There's another 150, billion dollars associated with that. So this is $68 billion where if we just gave that to the states or gave that to the local uh, uh, school boards, uh, it would probably look and feel a lot more like $150 billion in terms of efficiencies and how much they're actually able to put to the ground. So, uh, but, but again, that just requires a lot of thought. It requires a lot of paying attention to. And, and you know, my sense is that uh, Congress, especially, and other branches of government at all levels, they just want to move fast and get through the issues of the day. But uh, again, going back to that conversation about China, this is a, this is a 100 to 500 year paradigm for them. And they know they've got us where they want us right now. As long as we ignore the debt, uh, that will be the bane of us. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, the alternative to doing a line by line assessment, like you say, Congressman, is, a, is higher taxes and Certainly in California, that's the last thing we need right now. Right. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you're, you know, you'll agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. The, 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 the answer to the debt needs to be on the spend side, not on the revenue side right now. We can't, we can't tax ourselves into a solution, especially not in the wake of COVID-19. The irony is that, you know, in California, they, they still can't figure it out. They're still talking now about uh, raising our taxes, removing Prop 13, which is the thing that's allowing a lot of folks to stay in their homes. Uh, you know, with the real estate tax being grandfathered at a, at a legacy rate. So, so even in the midst of all of these challenges that small businesses employees are having, now Sacramento's talking about dialing up our taxes and it's the wrong answer. It's, it's testimony that they don't understand how the economy works. And we've got to focus right now on the, on the demand side of, of this economy, uh, improve uh, uh, consumer confidence, get the unemployment rates back down, 
uh, and then their, their precious tax revenue will, will ultimately come, come to fruition like, like they want it to. But, you know, this is a state where we had a surplus on an annual basis and they were still dialing up our taxes. And when, and when, and when things went uh, south at the, at the national level and at the state level, uh, that rainy day fund that they've been touting all of a sudden went away as well. So uh, we need more accountability. And, and, and rather than raising our taxes, we need to raise the standards of those who are spending our tax money. And, and uh, you know, we need to hold politicians accountable who are making these decisions. Yeah, yeah, Congressman, you know, it seems like, uh, I'm going to get your comment on this, just a few more questions. Um, sure. It seems like California and President Trump got off on the wrong foot together. And, uh, you know, as you know, well, it's been, you know, three years of what seems to be animosity between the Trump administration and California leadership, you know, for years now. And, uh, and I, I'm sure in some ways, maybe some seen, some unseen ways, it's certainly not helpful to Californians for that to be the case. I wonder if, because you're a, a newly elected, rare Republican elected in state of California, if you think you might be able to play a helpful bridge between the state at the federal level and uh, and the Trump administration? You think that's in the cards? I, I think it is. Uh, you know, and I, and I and I try not to. You know, I don't read my own press reports or press releases, and I and I and I, I never overpromise and underdeliver. I try to tr to be to be realistic in expectations at all times. But one of the one of the first things I said. You know, I've had a few conversations with the president. And one of the First things I said was, please, Mr. President, don't don't give up on California. Um, and and I get it. You know, he he's a businessman by by nature, uh, and and for businessmen, we care about results. And and when you see the product coming out of California, and you see the level of resistance that he gets on a daily basis uh, from the Democrats, but also some other other sources out of California. Um, it, it makes sense. It, it, it's it's a rational thought to to not be a big fan of California. Uh, and I think in the, in the end, as Californians, we're, we're really not big fans of, of, of all aspects of California either. I love the weather. I love the geography. I love most of the people. Uh, I love being in the shadows of the Reagan Library. But when you look at our policies and what we have to deal with from, from AB5 to, to, to the highest taxes, the fact that our politicians are spending money on illegal immigrants before they're spending money on seniors and veterans, uh, these are things that should rattle us to our core. And uh, again, I, I go back to we don't have to hit rock bottom. And I, and I think that, that President Trump is seeing that there are pockets of opportunity in California. And, and, as, and as things have gotten more difficult with the economy because of COVID-19 uh, and AB5, uh, there are more people in that middle third that are starting to pay a lot more attention to, to who they're voting for. And I think as long as we as conservatives just remind people that it's about the values, it's about survival. Uh, this isn't about putting on a jersey and making it a, a Dodgers versus Nationals uh, kind of fight. It's not a Republican versus Democrat fight. It's about lower taxes. It's about being pro-life. It's about being pro-military, pro-law enforcement and doing what's right for our country and just being able to survive in this state. Um, we'll, we'll win over two thirds of the population when we do it correctly. And the candidate matters, the team matters. You've got to be able to put in the hard work and make the sacrifices to make it happen. But uh, we have we have some great opportunities in California now. Uh, David Valadeo, Michelle Steele, Young Kim, uh, Daryl Issa—they're all coming back, and, and we're going to get some of these federal level seats back and uh, all the lower level seats in, in Sacramento that hopefully come with us. So. Uh, I think the president's eyes wide open that there is opportunity in California. Yeah, agreed. Um, you mentioned law enforcement. I can't help but, you know, ask that, you know, the, obviously, and rightly so, the topic of the day uh, in right. the past few weeks have been this terrible, terrible, uh, you know, the death of uh, George Floyd and the nation's reaction to it. Um, and it's certainly understandable, the anger and the concern out there in uh, any minority community over what happened. But I wonder if you feel that the answer is what's being promoted recently with respect to let's just defund the police and eliminate police departments. I mean, that has got to be a wrong turn, is it not? Yeah, it, it absolutely is. And, you know, I was, I was sickened by, by the video that I saw that we all saw, you know, watching an American 
getting murdered on the streets of America is, is as shocking as it gets. To, to see that happen at the hands of another American for, for no good reason uh, is, is, is just appalling. Um, so, so like you said, I think you said it perfectly. We, we have a right to be upset. Um, I, I don't blame protesters for going out and exercising their constitutional rights to make the statement to, to ask for change. Um, but, th th and, and I pray for justice for, for George Floyd and his family. I, I believe they, they will get the justice that they, they deserve. Uh, but the key is how do we avoid this, right? And, and, I, and, I, and I have faith in the judicial system and, and there's pockets that need to be improved there as well. Uh, the, I, I'd rather see us figure out a way to prevent these things from happening so that we don't have to ask for justice on the backside. Um, and, and, and defunding the police is certainly not the answer. Uh, when, when you d defund the police, you're going to start looking like Venezuela uh, and Cuba within a matter of days, uh, if not hours. So uh, we, we need to encourage good Americans to want to go into law enforcement. Uh, we need to make sure that the law enforcement agencies are, are training properly, that they're getting the resources, that they're getting the latest techniques uh, in terms of de-escalation and working with the communities. Uh, and what I'm especially proud of in our district with the Simi Valley Police Department and the sheriffs uh, in, in Santa Clarita and the Antelope Valley is they are embedded in the communities and they are part of the community. So when you, when you see uh, a police officer on the street, uh, it, it really isn't an us versus them in our district. And, I, and I'm proud of that. I, I, and that's, that's the environment I grew up in. The bottom line is that we, we need to teach our kids to be respectful of law enforcement, not fear them. But we also need a, a, a mechanism that, that allows us to weed out the bad actors, that allows us to remove uh, the law enforcement officers that we know have a history of, of problems. And, and when you interview 100 cops and, and you ask them, hey, who would you not want to go out on the streets with? And 97, 98 percent of them all say the same name. Uh, that's a trend, and, and we need to pay attention to that, and they can't, be, they can't have a level of, of immunity that prevents them from being held accountable for their past actions, because those will be the ones typically uh, that lead to the, these types of incidents. So uh, we've got to figure it out. We've, we've, we've got some legislation coming down the pipe uh, in, in Washington, D.C. that's going to address this. Uh, again, defunding police or cutting funding for police right now is the absolute wrong answer. We need to, to come together from both sides of the aisle and figure out how to weed out the bad actors, how to improve transparency in the training, and um, there, there, there are ways to help mitigate this from happening in the future. Yeah, they, the CME police, the sheriff's offices, uh, they, they've been just stellar in their performance in terms of their cooperation and ability to work with uh, many, many things we do here at the Reagan Library. So I think yeah, you're absolutely, absolutely right about that, yeah. And, and I'll say this too, John, you know, the, the protesters in our district, uh, it did it right as well, you know, and, and I think what we saw in our cities and see me, Santa Cruz, Antelope Valley were the model for the nation. Protest is good. It's your first First Amendment right. I, that's what I fought for in, in, in the skies of Iraq to protect our Constitution and our way of life and uh, freedom to assemble and freedom of speech are, are, are the first part of the Constitution for a reason. So, um, you know, I think we were the role models on, on how to do it peacefully within the legal limits and uh, being non-disruptive, non-violent, and, and not causing, you know, damage to property. So extremely proud of the protesters uh, for the way they conducted themselves uh, in, in the wake of this, and they, they did it with dignity and honor. Agreed, agreed. Uh, last two questions. Um, this next one's kind of an overarching question. I wonder, uh, Congressman, I, you have likely seen the survey numbers. Um, you know, they go out and test uh, the uh, viewpoints of Americans of all ages and almost 50% of the youth in this nation uh, when asked whether or not they would support a socialist uh, style government say the an and give the answer of yes. And it, it just seems to me remarkable that that could be the, uh, true in this stage in America after, you know, generations of uh, men like President Reagan were able to defeat those uh, uh, viewpoints around the world. And I wonder if you have a comment on that. I do. Uh, it, it, and a lot of people will point to the school systems, higher education uh, institutions, and, and say there's been indoctrination. There, there certainly may be some of that. There is, there is some of that. Uh, I'll give them that. Uh, but what I, what I point to as causal factor in this is, is uh, a lack of parenting. 
Uh, I don't think parents and grandparents are taking the time to explain to their kids where we come from as a nation, uh, why, why certain things are, are worded a certain way in the Constitution, why are we a republic instead of a, a democracy, um, you know, what, what has happened in Cuba, what has happened in, in Vietnam, North Korea, Venezuela, what, what the Cold War was all about, you know, how did President Reagan deal with these issues, uh, and, and we can't blame the youth, right, because they haven't seen firsthand how these things evolve. Uh, they've started to see a glimpse of it. I think we had a two month uh, uh, trial subscription to, co to socialism during COVID-19 and it was ugly and none of us liked it, I don't think. So it, it's up to the parents. It's up to the parents to, to, to instill the values and explain why capitalism is good, explain why competition is good, explain uh, why lower taxes uh, are, are a good thing for, for our country and, and why peace through strength makes sense and why it's okay to have a strong military, why it's okay to have uh, 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 law enforcement. Uh, you know, uh, th these are conversations that we didn't think we had to have, but we do and we clearly do. And, and it's uh, it, it, in the absence of the Cold War, in the absence of the Vietnam War, or Korea War, World War II, uh, where, where those lessons were self-evident, it requires the parents to teach the, the, the younger generations and the grandparents to teach the generations. And I'll, I'll gladly trade, uh, you know, having those conversations instead of having world wars in order to, to make sure that we can continue this, this, this great legacy of our country. Um, but it does require us to take the time and not be dependent on only the school systems to teach that. Yeah. Last question, Congressman, uh, term limits. I I, I think you uh, support them, um, in, and you did in your campaign. I, I wonder, I mean, congratulations. I, uh, I know not every member of Congress uh, might feel that way because, you know, they want to gain the seniority after being there many years. But what brought you, uh, what is it about your life and your background that brought you to the conclusion that, uh, at least at the federal level, um, people should enter and, you know, go back to civilian life at some point? Yeah, you know, it's really it's really reading about our founding fathers and what they did in the in the in the nascent days of our of our country's history and, and how they formed it. Um, they, they they weren't professional politicians. They they did it in the spirit of patriotism. They were truly citizen legislators, and that that to me I think is the key. If you have a desire to stay in D.C. for twenty years, there's there to me, frankly, this is maybe a judgment call. There's something wrong with you, and uh, you should want to go back to your district and contribute to your community in different ways. The flip side of that is if you're not able to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish in say 10 years of service in the house, uh, then maybe that wasn't the job for you. And maybe you weren't the right person to represent the district either. Um, so I do believe in term limits and, and, I, and, I, and I believe it gives the, the, you know, the opposite, uh, uh, opponents to term limits say, hey, uh, you, you have a term limit, it's every two years and the, and the constituents get to decide uh, whether or not you return. And, and that is true. Uh, but I do think that after 10 years or so, you start losing touch with why you initially ran, what the needs of your district are, because maybe you're not there as much as you should be. Uh, the challenge that we have as supporters of term limits is we can't seem to agree on a number. Uh, there's a couple pieces of legislation out there that talk about six years. Uh, in my opinion, uh, 10 years is the right number. That allows you to figure out uh, in your first two sessions, uh, how to do your job. It allows you in your third session to uh, take on a meaningful role in a committee uh, and, and get meaningful legislation through that committee in, in, the, in the fourth session. Uh, and then it also allows you to, to, to do the mentorship that's needed to, to help inspire the next generation of representatives in that fourth and fifth term. Uh, and, and again, you know, it, it may be painful and, and I, you know, I may be kicking myself in 10 years from now saying, hey, I wish I hadn't said this, but I do believe it's the right answer. And I, and I think there's other ways to serve your country. There's other ways to represent your constituents than to be in the House for, for more than 10 years. And uh, uh, I, I think that that is a, a message that resonates with more than three quarters of the population as well. And um, Again, if you're doing it for the right reasons to support and defend the Constitution, uh, you should look forward to finding your replacement and, and helping them uh, be successful and, and, uh, and, and making sure that you're keeping fresh faces in the, in the people's house. Yeah. Again, well said.
Congressman, congratulations again on your victory. Uh, and um, I, I, I can't tell you how much we look forward to your representation of the Reagan Library, the 25th Congressional District of the absolute best of luck to you and just know you're invited to, uh, to come see us at the Reagan Library anytime. I appreciate that, John. It'd be a huge honor. Uh, one of the most painful things is uh, with the COVID-19 is not being able to to come to my grace land and spend time there. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, I appreciate you uh, hosting me for this, uh, for this interview. Okay, take care. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for today's virtual programming event. We hope this conversation has inspired you to share what you've learned with your family and friends and that you'll join us again for an upcoming event. And let me offer lesson number one about America. All great change in America begins at the dinner table. So tomorrow night in the kitchen, I hope the talking begins. And children, if your parents haven't been teaching you what it means to be an American, let them know and nail them on it. That would be a very American thing to do.